to be a slightly quirky and more anthropological take on where intellectual property rights are going at the present moment, as you will no doubt note from the title. So just bear with me. I hope this is going to be kind of interesting and hopefully also provocative and maybe resonant in unexpected ways. You won't hear the word Supreme Court appear in my talk, but that'll be okay, I think. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so firstly, my thanks very much to Greg and Beres for inviting me and seeing many of my old friends here. Uh, I I'd like to begin just by acknowledging the input of two of my collaborators here, David Einhorn, who's the Chief count Legal Counsel at the Jackson Laboratory that I will speak about in this talk, and my colleague Gail Davies, whose interest and work on model organisms first alerted me to the IPR issues that are implicit in this subject. Now I want to just preface this by saying what I'm going to talk about here is a mouse commons. I want you to keep in mind while I'm talking, we're talking about a commons environment, which is fundamentally different, counter-intuitive to almost everything we've talked about today. And as you'll, as we'll note, including um, Dan's talk, what I'm going to, some parts of what I'm going to mention will kind of flip those things on their head because we're talking about a commons environment. Okay, so what I want to do in this paper, in this time uh, that I have available, is to provide a kind of analysis that, of some developments that are occurring in the world of model mice organisms. Most specifically, the impetus to create what people hope will be a genuinely comprehensive, widely accessible mouse commons, as it is called. And that's part of a wider internationally supportive initiative to try and promote the share wearing, we might call, of, uh, call it, of mammalian genetic resources. In so doing, I want to examine the role that various IPR instruments are now playing in either facilitating or obstructing that goal. Okay? So this will be a paper of two parts. In the first part, I examined some evidence that has been derived from a recent case study on the significance and effectiveness of patents in protecting the interests of donors, as they are called, of engineered mice strains that have been deposited at the Jackson Laboratory at, in Bar Harbor in Maine, which is the world's largest repository of research mouse strains. And I want to consider here how things like reach through rights to downstream inventions or royalties on products are asserted in relationship to licensed mice and to what degree patents assert, as it is often argued, a noticeable anti-commons or general, generally constraining effect on their circulation or use within academia and beyond. Now, in making those assessments, I want to pay particular attention to the changing ontological construction, value and performance, if we might call it that, of the mouse itself. I want to argue here, one key point to begin with, that as the number and diversity of mouse models proliferates in direct response to the need to develop ever more specialised platforms for investigating uh, disease and analysing a multiplicity of kind of gene phenotype relations, so, so the desire to exert patent rights over every resultant organism becomes both economically untenable and within a commons environment undesirable. So the emphasis, I would argue, is now shifting. It's no longer necessarily to patent each mouse as a genetically altered thing, something that made sense when reductionist approaches to genetics assumed that there might be one model for one disorder, so that was a nice clean uh, understanding, but rather to attempt to control through, the, through process patents, which we've also talked about today, the constituent elements or kind of software of the genetic engineering processes that are being performed that enable the mouse to exist in the world in a particular way. So it's like not trying to patent every single mouse, it's trying to patent the process by which the mouse appears in the world as it does, if that makes any sense. Okay, so in, in explaining why patents of whole mice, as the single entity, is in this losing its purchase in this context, it's important to examine and indeed to critique what the role of IPR mechanisms such as patents is presu as presumed to be and how this is challenged in a commons environment or share-wearing environment. Historically, patents have been viewed as a vehicle um, through which to deliver reach-through rights for donors to downstream inventions that are produced from their strains. 
But in a biological commons, as we shall see, this can often be secured just as effectively through other mechanisms like licensing and material transfer agreements. Though, as we shall see further on, material transfer agreements, I would argue, have some surprisingly strong anti-commons effects, more than people have anticipated. I believe, however, that some older, some would say more modest IPR mechanisms are also being called back into service to pre perform a different kind of work here. While the patents are both too economically burdensome and I would also argue kind of insufficiently nimble to really perform this work. What I want to argue in the second part of the paper, rather controversially, I think, is that the primary work of IPR instruments in the brave new world of the biological commons is not, in fact, to deliver royalties to donors, but rather to protect the personality, identity, moral standing, and foremostly reputation of the protected strain. This, I would argue, is clearly evidenced in the inc increasing reliance on an old friend, trademarks, to protect biologically engineered strains. A move that I will argue in conclusion represents another rather surprising access, access to the story of the humanisation, or should we say personalisation, of experimental mouse models. Okay, so let's begin with some background on what's happening in the world of model mice. At a molecular level, mice and humans are remarkably similar, with 99% of human genes having mouse counterparts or homologs. They also share with humans almost all of the genetic diseases, all of the diseases that are genetic in origin, and so prove a very valuable surrogate for studying these diseases through the analysis of spontaneous genetic mutations in mice, which are now deliberately induced. Now, historically, the first mice used in research were inbred strains, which are produced after 20 sequential generations of sibling matings, at which point offspring are considered essentially clonal, that is stable, and thus ideal for the reproducibility of experimental data without the influence of time or place. So scientists can now insert genes from organisms, even human genes, into a mouse to create transgenic mice, um, and even selectively disable particular genes at will and make what are described as knockout mice. So genes with a mice with a knocked out gene. Now we know that genetically engineered organisms have been patentable since the Chakrabarti case of 1980, and that in 1988 the US PTO awarded Harvard University the first ever patent for a whole animal, a transgenic mouse whose cells have been genetically engineered to carry the cancer promoting gene. Um, and the DuPont company, which had funded the research program, uh, that produced the mouse was granted an exclusive right, uh, sorry, an exclusive license to patent rights on the mouse in return. So DuPont trademarked the mouse as Onco Mouse and took the position that anyone who used such genetically altered mice, their, their mouse, no matter what the method of alteration, had to obtain a license from DuPont, including biomedical researchers in universities, governments, and non-profit institutions. So in other words, everyone that uses these genetically altered uh, mice had to pay. Now we're all aware of the furore that ensued after the Onco mouse, mouse case, which redoubled when Baylor University patented their P53 knockout mouse, which crucially had been developed with federal US and not corporate funding, this is public funding, licensed it to a pharmaceutical company, GenFarm, who then insisted that all prospective academic users also be licensed to pay annual royalties and desist from breeding the mice internally. So very similar things to what we've seen in the earlier talks. Now these concerns erupted publicly at the Mouse Molecular Genetics meeting at Cold Harbour in 1992, made famous by Harold Varmus's impassioned plea about the importance of academia maintaining unfettered access to all model mice, a call also taken up by Dr. Keith Pagan at a time the director of Jackson, who announced that Jackson would take on the responsibility of distributing genetically altered mice to the academic community, as Jackson had always done historically, without license restrictions. Okay, so the philosophy of the repository, which became known thereafter as the induced mutant resource, I always think that sounds rather harsh, but anyway, there it is, or the IMR, was to accept 
and distribute genetically engineered mice that were donated to the resource, whether patented or not, okay, and to then distribute them to academia unfettered by onerous licensing requirements such as reach through or royalty rights. That's the philosophy, okay? So this resulted in the genesis of what we now refer to as the Mouse Academic Research Commons or the Mouse Commons in short. An earlier precursor of the open source share wearing phenomena in biology that has become a key mode of exchange within the life sciences and I'm sure as Jane will note in synthetic biology in her next talk. But also as reflected in the Bermuda rules specifying public domain dis disposi uh, sorry, deposition of the human genome project sequences etc and the single nucleotide polymorphisms consortium commitment to public domain deposition as well. Okay. So that conceptual framework requires participants from academia to forego assertion of their proprietorial claims over the mice strains that they've developed when recirculated to other research sciences within academia, okay? So this common forbearance is achieved through the social mechanism of peer pressure and the understanding that the NIH fully expects that mice developed with federal funds be made readily available to its grantees in academia. Now, since any member of the Mouse Commons is both a potential developer and an expectant user of these mouse strains developed by others, they're encouraged to view them not as tangible products to be products to be maximally commercialised without regard to the impact on other researchers, but rather as research tools that have what I would call careers that must be both protected and promoted. Now, researchers at Jackson, including David Einhorn, were recently funded by the NIH to undertake a study to assess whether and how patents on some strains may have inhibited their dissemination or utilisation by academic researchers, and the degree to which this in turn might have inhibited downstream development of proprietary products based on that knowledge or resources. And they were able to do this at Jackson, as some deposited mouse strains are patented and others are not, okay? So they're trying to assess the degree to which this made any difference. So the primary goal of the analysis was to determine whether, and if so, how, the existence of patents covering individual mouse strains or patents on technologies used to make mice are reflected in the end in Jackson's distribution agreements. And whether or how the distribution um, by Jackson of mice affected by patents differed from those not affected by patents. So the distribution agreements are described as donor licenses and the strains covered, strains of mice are called licensed strains. Now 47 donor licenses were reviewed that contained at least one patented mouse strain. So in other words, 47 patented strains of mice were looked at. Significantly, however, none of the donor licences involving patented strains had any substantive restrictions that required academic recipients of mice from Jackson's to give these donors any reach-through rights, nor did they seek to impose any internal breeding or publication restrictions, although they did have some field of use restrictions. Interestingly, nearly exactly the same results applied to the 70 donor licences covering mouse strains for which no patents had been issued. None of those donor licences either had any reach through internal breeding or publication restrictions and one only, only one had a field of use restriction. Of course, donors are able to impose more stringent licence conditions on for-profit researchers and they often do. So 91% of the donor licences covering patented mice required for-profit entities to conform to quite strict conditions of use and dissemination um, for example, and some entirely prohibited distribution to for-profits. However, when it came to distribution within the academic research community, Einhorn, Einhorn and his team concluded that donor licences were nearly universally free of any substantive restrictions on downstream research, and this was true whether the mouse strain that was donated to it um, was patented or not. So from these results, Einhorn and his team concluded that there's no meaningful distinction between donor licences in which patented strains are involved and those where no strains are patented when it comes to substantive or procedural restrictions, or lack thereof, on downstream research performed with these mice. So in other words, the anti-commons effect was in practice decidedly weak, which is interesting. The study did confirm, as I predicted in my book, Trading the Genome, that MTAs, 
upon which the administration increasingly relies to trace the trajectories and successive uses of the mice as they circulate in an open source commodity had, have in fact become very bureaucratically burdensome, so much so that they actually threaten that the, the ethos of open source uh, mouse commons in ways that people perhaps did not entirely anticipate, but that's something we'll have to discuss elsewhere. Rather than concentrating on that, I want to turn now to discuss what I see as the most interesting set of questions to emerge from this study, and here I move into speculative mode. The first question that emerges is why the patent of the whole mouse organism seems to have so little relevance in negotiations over their prospective circulation and use. As I suggested in the introduction, the explanation for this can be found in part, I believe, in the way that model mice are now understood ontologically, characterised and employed in research set settings. So rather than being seen as a finished product to be covetously controlled as a single piece of tangible intellectual property, the engineered mouse and mouse model colonies from which they've drawn are now seen as a research platform, a vital experimental space, a kind of operative space, a laboratory, if you like, within which to continually experiment on the software of mammalian genetics and phenotypical associations. So what I want to argue here is that what is significant, I think, in such a vitalist laboratory is what has always been significant and important in any laboratory. Conditions of consistency and stability, which militate against the scientist's arch enemy, the unknown variable. This is why, very interestingly, I think, researchers at the Jackson Laboratory, who have always been so philosophically opposed to product patents, are now focusing their attention much more on what are termed process patents. But they are process patents for very interesting things. They are patents designed that are designed to protect an attribute, a quality, that is in my view, that is becoming increasingly important in all open source and collective common enterprises. And that quality is reputation. So let us consider first what these process patents are for, and I want to give one pertinent example here, which is then going to lead me into a brief consideration of the much neglected role of trademarks in experimental science, before I conclude finally with a few thoughts on what the increased use of trademarks might say about what I think of as the seemingly infinite ingress of personalisation into many aspects of contemporary biological science. Okay. So the Jackson Laboratory, what is this patent process? I hope I've got these. Oh, that's their policy on licensing and restriction, which is very open. In short, it can go anywhere and you can pretty much do what you want with it. These are typical, this is from their, their reference library of, of mice. Um, I'll just ask you to note this for later on. This strain is a good breeder. So they're giving characteristics about what you can do with the mouse. Okay, oh, back, back, back. Okay, so this, is what one of the things that they're patenting through a process patent. The patent which was announced in September last year is for what is called their genetic stability program. What is it and how does it work? The Jackson now has over 4,000 models, mouse models, mice, you know, models of mice, each with a very different and specific genetic profile. However, just a few of these models, what they call their standard inbred strains, represent the vast majority of the mice used in the research and they're consequently bred in very large numbers. Now one significant problem that has emerged is that of genetic drift within these mice colonies over time. Spontaneous mutations can occur even within populations that are essentially clonal. While some of these mutations are immediately evident, others are more subtle and difficult to detect and this is highly problematic. Over time, the identity, the personality, we might even say, of the model mouse will change. It will become, in effect, a poor copy of itself. One riven with inconsistencies, corrupted, polluted, dissolute. 
random variations in a strain introduce inconsistencies that can jeopardise the validity of research experiments performed on them. So you perform the experiment on this mouse one year, you come back five years later to do the experiment again, and it's not the same because the mouse ain't the same. Oops, that's the kind of variation, that's the kind of unknown variable that's creeping into this performative laboratory experimental space that we have to get rid of. Jackson has to get rid of. What is at risk if they don't is that when this occurs is that, I would argue, the reputation of the strain and with it the reputation of the Jackson brand is at risk. So the GSP program, get this, remedies this potential for besmirchment of character, we might say, by refreshing the integrity of the strain. So how does it do that? It does that by literally revitalising the strains with new genetic material. Okay? The patented system enables the production colonies to be literally rebooted, as they put it, with cryogenically preserved embryos or gametes from specially prepared stock every five generations. This refreshment effectively freezes or stabilises the genetic profile of the mouse, as they put it, quote, stopping the accumulation of mutations and revolutionising the uniformity of the mouse as a research tool. The stocks are set up to give a 25-year supply of genetically consistent mouse models. Now, here's where we go slightly esoteric, but just hang with me. Protection of brand identity, I would argue, has a long history in corporate development. Historically, the trademark has performed the function of associating manufactured goods with their owners or originators. As Scheck denotes in his seminal treatise on the history of trademarks, until the early medieval period, the trademark performed a dual function as both a personal or proprietary mark and a production mark at the same time, simply because the maker and the merchant were one and the same person. Okay? So the mark assured the quality of the good through direct association with the person or qualities or identity, indeed the reputation of the maker. So if it's parry shoes, they're good because I made them and everybody knows me, so it's my reputation on the line. But with mass production came the detachment of the maker, him or herself, from the manufactured product, at which point reputation was something that came to be understood as subsisting in the corporate identity of the brand, not the person who made it. Right? So it's a Gucci handbag, and that's why it's a good handbag, it's a Gucci handbag which could in some instances even take this corporate identity of the brand, which could in some instances even take the form of an imagined individual. So if we take the case of Betty Crocker, the iconic American cake maker, cake maker we can see something interesting, that a degree of genetic drift, we might say, has also occurred in this entirely fabricated identity over time. Now what's interesting though is in the Betty Crocker case, this is actively valorised and enrolled in the refreshment of their brand. So, in other words, they remake Betty every few years. They embrace her genetic drift. They watch that. And fascinatingly, in this case, the last Betty Crocker is an ethnic composite of all of women in the US. <laughs> so, dare I say, they're loving their genetic drift in their brand. Okay, that's what's going on there. However, more typically, corporate producers work incredibly hard to maintain consistency in brand performance and identity. They don't want change, actually, right? And to ensure that the unlicensed manufacturer of inferior copies of the products do not in any way tarnish the reputation of the brand. So take, for example, oops, sorry, we'll go back in a minute. Take Brasso, there it is in 1920 now, Coke now, okay, as good examples of the perceived importance of maintaining the integrity of the brand's reputation by not, as it were, mucking around with it, okay. Very significantly, I think, we are now seeing a re-embrace of trademark and its prospective utility in some areas of the life sciences, though this has not as yet been well researched. However, it's certainly evident in the Jackson Laboratory. Jackson itself first filed for a trademark protection for their mice in 1940, very early on, and there is the brand. I think you would agree. I think you would agree. As you'll note from the deposition filed then with the USPTO, they applied for the word 
Jack's mice, which was a sign, though not without a disclaimer, interestingly the patent officer wanted made clear that the word mice alone was not being trademarked, you know, fascinating resonances with not, um, you know, fundamental, but patenting fundamental products of nature, it's a fundamental word, okay, so we can't do that either. Um, but basically it was passed at that time. Now, while Jackson continue, has continued to empl employ this brand over many years, there it is on their box of mice, okay, um, it's now relying on it, I think, to perform more important work in securing and promoting the reputation and integrity of Jackson's strains and in promoting the corporate identity and reputation of the laboratory itself. There are interesting reasons for this. Jackson has never promoted patenting of whole organisms, that being antithetical to their philosophy of facilitating the unencumbered circulation of mouse genetic resources, okay? So I'm just, I've got two more pages, okay? So just hang with me. Um, they, they want to, they, they, they don't hold with patenting whole organisms, okay? But this has implications for Jackson and their mouse economy. Whether patented or not, in a biological commons, their mouse models now circulate, as we have seen, with minimal use restrictions or reach through rights. Two developments may eventuate as a consequence. Firstly, as Jackson circulates its mice only subject to very general um, and very generous, I might add, conditions of use protocol, they forego their right to prohibit recipients from breeding. In fact, they even tell you that their mice are good breeders, right? In, in direct counterpoint to Dan's apples case, okay? Um, and they don't, of course, receive any royalties or any income from the mice that they then circulate. The recipients, however, if they don't subscribe to an open source commons ethos, may on the other hand patent the strains that they develop from Jackson's germinal stock. And in recent news it was reported that just such a research institute, the Central Institute for Experimental Animals based in Kawasaki, Japan, had bought a patent infringement against Jackson for distributing a strain of genetically modified mice that they assert was overly similar to the one they had developed. The NIH, which funds the Jackson lab, were appalled by this and asked the lab to countersue, arguing that the CIEA is in fact the infringing party as it developed its strain from a mouse originally circulated to it by Jackson. Okay? Now, whilst the outcome of that particular skirmish is not known, it does suggest the difficulties that Jackson experiences and will increasingly experience in regulating how their resources are utilised in an open share wearing genetic commons. You can't you'll send it out there, you can't control it. And perhaps more importantly, how they can protect the stability, the reputation, the integ integrity, both corporeal and epistemological, of their mammalian research tools and brand. One way of achieving this is to rely on a combination of process patents, such as that on the GSP program, to ensure genetic consistency and integrity of the strain, and then trademark to protect the reputation of both the strains and the maker. Whilst the absence of patent and associated reach through rights may result in lost revenue, this can be recouped through the deft application of trademark, which delivers in this case a reputational guarantee of quality that is simply unrivaled in the economy of mouse genetics. One that ensures finally that Jack's mice TM are the gold standard inbred mammalian strain with the highest throughput volume of sales in the world. So in other words, they just sell more because you're like, I'm going to get a mouse, I want to get a top draw mouse, and where do I get one of those from? It's the Jackson Laboratory, okay? So, in, the, in an open source economy, as David Einhorn reminds us, Donors also generally appreciate the value of having their mice available from a leading mammalian institution and trademarked in this way um, because it makes their, their um, mice more desirable to other people. Okay, so finally, and I really do have half a page here, I just want to offer a couple of reflections on what the return to trademark might say about some other kinds of ontological drift. The drift, for example, that is evidenced in the humanisation of mice or in some other more recent compulsions to invest technological artefacts with rights of personality and, curiously enough, even privacy. So in a recent paper that I wrote for the Max Planck, I reported on the fact that at a recent visit to the Admiral's Hospital Brain Bank, where I've also been conducting some research, I was refused permission to photograph some anonymised histopathological slides. 
as, a fo as photography, I was told, was an activity for which the individual had not given their explicit consent. To take the photograph of their slide in the absence of such a consent would be, as I was informed, a breach of their privacy and in contravention of their human rights. So in the wake of the Alder Hay scandal in the UK, the slide is now regarded, it seems, not as a highly technological artefact, but rather as an entity that is fully commensurate with the whole living body from which it was drawn. So the slide, I would argue, has acquired a personality, it seems, and with it something akin to legally constituted personality rights, including the right to privacy. Similarly, it would seem that the mouse model... Oops. <coughs> Okay. Similarly, um, that's the slide. That's the only photograph I, I took that surreptitiously. That photograph of the slides as I was walking out the door. Right. So it's a banned photo of the slides who cannot speak their name. Okay. Similarly, it would seem that the mouse model is now becoming humanised at more than a molecular genetic level. It's no longer characterised simply as a technological research tool. It too has acquired an identity, a personality, a reputation that is not only privileged but which requires active protection from tarnishment. While the global mouse commons might create a permissive space of exchange, the model mouse it seems should not circulate too promiscuously within it, not at least without the reputational protection that a trademark can afford. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got two questions. One is, um, are you using the word software metaphorically in this context or not? Mm -hmm. And the second one is um, about the kind of the idea that the mouse changes that you mm -hmm. talked about. We're using the singular mouse, not mice. So when you have that singular idea of a mouse, but it actually changes, how does that relate to the idea of a mouse having a personality to be an individual? Yeah. Well, I think in terms of the first one, yes, in this case I am using the software kind of metaphorically, although I guess you could argue the sort of DNA information embodied in the living organism thing, if you want to go there. I gave up at the end of my book in, you know, the, the trying to robustly assert that something was informational or, informational or corporeal. I think there's, you know, exchange there. In, in, in regards to your second question, I think what's interesting about the genetic stability program is Pro, you know, program that they're doing is that they actually are trying to keep them. I would argue that what it seems to me, they're trying to keep the mouse's identity stable. So, okay, there's lots of mice in the colony, but they're all clonal of each other. So it's like we don't want this mice, this mouse, turning into someone else or something else. You know, um, we want it to stay put uh, in exactly the way that we left it. We don't want any sort of variation in it. So I think. But the individual must die. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's that clonal thing because they're being reproduced, they're being sort of digitally, you know, if you like, copied from one another. Um, you know, in effect, the the single mouse is a kind of um, emblematic of the colony. So whether or not that one in particular lives or dies doesn't matter so much as as long as the strain remains consistent. Okay, quite a cue. Uh, gentleman at the back, Ben, Becky, then Bob, then Dan. Thanks for a very illuminating talk, and I definitely did not look at my song in a similar way and hope. Uh, what I found, and this is also an observation from uh, some history on town reading and mm -hmm. nurserymen, and but this, this the civility program you talk about has that rhetoric of purity, yeah. uh, which which both breeders, you know, at the turn of the century yeah. when Mendelian genetics was rediscovered, were seeking as a way to legitimize their distinction from farmers who were possibly doing the same thing, mm -hmm. possibly without mm -hmm. the suits and mm -hmm. the clothes. Mm -hmm. and, and so they adopted a similar sort of rhetoric of the purity of the right mm -hmm. as a way to secure their rights and their property. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is interesting in the way that you talk of trademarks uh, here, uh, there they also had a similar sort of attempt to try and get trademarks on their property. Mm -hmm. And later the intellectual property system actually legitimizes that by saying the breeder should maintain the right mm. And so like a snapshot where the property, while it circulates and is biologically changing, mm. must be static. Mm. So that tension between change and staticness of property is, yeah. is I like very that. similar. Very similar. And, and I mean, I'm slightly surprised because I'm thinking, 
Well, I mean, you know, just from my years of work sort of uh, in STS now, I'm like, hello, you want this thing to sit still? Is that what the whole idea is? You know, which seems to me kind of, gosh, that's a flawed endeavour, you know, in the biological sciences. But in another way, I can see, as I said, if you don't see the mouse as a finished thing, if you see the mouse as an experimental space, as a laboratory, you want, you need that laboratory to be consistent. That's the problem. Whether or not they can really achieve it, I don't know, but I think that's what they're aiming for. Thank you. So, um, it, 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 thank you for that very interesting paper. It, it, it seems to me that uh, the Jackson Labs has two things going for it, uh, two reputational advantages going yes. for it. One is that they are a great source of high quality yeah. mice that are what they purport to be. And the other is their position as sort of leaders in the open source sharing mm -hmm. kind of bio. Uh, uh, community and so uh, it seems like their trademark rights uh, uh, and perhaps their process patent rights both support that first reputational advantage that we yeah. produce great mice. Yes. Uh, but there's some tension at least between their process patents and yeah. their their roles as or, as open source uh, providers. So what do they do with those patents? Do they uh, enforce those patents? Do they assert those patents? Yeah. Why did they get them, and what do they Such do? Such a good with question. Them? And I indeed also thought, oh hello, you know you're all into open source and shareware, but you've got a load of process patents. Uh -huh. That seems a bit antithetical to your whole project. But maybe, like I said, it's not a product patent, and so they neatly skip around all that kind of, you know, we we control a living organism thing. They've just skirted that. But what if we're controlling high-quality production? Isn't that just as evil? Yeah, well, I think they might think that they, that, 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 that can be substantiated or legitimated more on the basis that you're processing a technology. It's, you know, like it really does avoid all that we're patenting life thing. Although, you know, maybe not, maybe not, I don't know. But I, I interestingly, it's a case in which I think they hold the patent, though it would be very interesting to know if anyone would be attempting to actually challenge that patent in practice in another laboratory, i.e. steal that idea and that technology. And the other thing I have to say is that when I looked at that process patent, it was a classic case, I thought, of a process patent for, well, what's innovative about that? And I mean, I don't know the details of the patent, but I thought, okay, so you sort of top up, it's like topping up a beer, isn't it? It's like, that's going a bit flat, or pour a bit more in the top, you know, of the sort of vital elements, and that'll get, keep it a bit more frothy, you know? I'm like, was that radical innovation? I, or, you know, seriously, they literally, they get out the mouse strain and the cryogenically preserved you know, em embryos, sort of, you know, germ plasm, stock, you know, whatever you want to call it, and go, Beep, that looks better, you know. Now, I guess there's a whole, I'm um, no doubt, and the whole high tech, you know, technique for how you do that. But conceptually, it's hardly, you know, rocket science, is it? I'm afraid we have time for just one more question, yeah. and, and uh, Cara. Uh, um, um, my question's about your use of the word uh, donor, as in, yeah. and whether that was your term or an actor category, and how that the implications of gifting fit in with this broader picture. Yeah, lovely question. It's their term, not my term. Um, and I think it, 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 it induces people to think in a share wearing, carry, sherry kind of way. You know, it's like you're going to donate and isn't that sweet, you know, like it's like when your university probably rings you up and asks you if you want to be a donor, you know, rather than, you know, it, it, it's sort of enrolling you in this whole idea that you're part of this family um, of, of, of people. Uh, so it's their turn. And I guess what they're inviting people to see is not to see themselves as owners of the strain they've developed, but to see themselves as people who would donate their strain, but also have one donated to them, like the sort of like blood donor analogy, if you like. Now that question of gifting and how it fits in is an extremely interesting one, because there are limits, of course, to that conception of gifting where people suddenly feel that, uh, and indeed, for instance, there is a very strong breach point when it comes to for-profit utilisation of these mouse trains. As I said, 91% of them said the wedding's off when it comes to a for-profit user. You know, you will pay, and that's that. So there's no gifting there. Um, but I guess that's the, 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 the conception that they're trying to induce within the in within the you know within their community of donors. Well, in a caring and sharing spirit, it's now time for us to break bread. <laughs>
Uh, lunch will be served downstairs uh, in the cafeteria. But before we break, let's just thank Ron for a terrific paper.